Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. At the risk of flogging a dead horse, as the saying goes, I'm going to uh, do a few more videos on the Arctic sea ice that uh, basically examine what will happen to the sea ice after the first blue ocean event, whether that event happens in five years, 10 years, two years, this year, whatever, you know, what will happen? Um, and I've discussed that in the last few uh, previous papers. Um, and uh, a couple very important things. There, there, there's a paper I'm going to discuss in this video, possibly the next, which is really, it's a fantastic paper um, about that topic. And then after that, I'll do a few more videos on looking at what effect the lack of aerosols uh, at the beginning of this year, you know, um, really cut back because of the coronavirus, because of industry shutting down, you know, and what that effect has on the Arctic, you know, has it, is it affecting the huge temperature anomalies that we're seeing in Siberia, for example, and these are having severe implications. We're getting forest fires starting up there um, much earlier than normal. Uh, we're getting permafrost collapse, um, which is damaging infrastructure. So an oil tank in, in Russia basically collapsed and had a huge oil spill up there, and it collapsed because of the melting permafrost. And also, you know, the huge temperatures up there, you know, what's that doing on the sea ice? I mean, the sea ice, if you go to the Arctic sea ice forums, Google Arctic sea ice graphs, go to the forums, people there are getting extremely concerned about the melt this year because the conditions are similar to that in 2012 which had a, which was the record minimum low so basically um the gist is that according to this uh you know recent paper there's a 95 percent chance of the complete loss of sea ice in the arctic in september with a global average temperature between 1.5 degrees and 1.9 degrees Celsius. So the mean of that is 1.7 degrees Celsius, no sea ice in September. The rate of change of the slope of the loss of sea ice graph is minus 4.1 million square kilometers per degree Celsius. That's the um, so-called um, you know, high sensitivity case in this paper. The low sensitivity case has the sea ice disappearing in September at 2.3 degrees Celsius total uh, above pre-industrial with the sensitivity of three point, minus 3.3 million square kilometers per degree Celsius. Now, what happens when the sea ice goes in September? Well, the number for August is 1.7 degrees Celsius for loss of sea ice in August. The same as September with a slope of minus 4.4 million square kilometers per degree Celsius. So bigger than September, but you know, that melt, the melt in September of course happens after the melt in August. So it's still likely that September loses its sea ice first. Then the next month to go, instead of October, it turns out it would be July probably uh, 2.2 degrees Celsius uh, temperature would comp have complete loss of sea ice in, in July. And then October would fall next at 2.3 Celsius. And then June would lose all sea ice with 3.4 degrees Celsius. Then November with 3.9. Then May with 4.7. Then December with 5.4. Then April with 6.6 .6 degrees Celsius. And these are conservative numbers, as the paper points out. And then we'd lose January at 7.7 .7 degrees Celsius. February, 8.7 degrees Celsius. And March would be the last holdout, 8.8 .8 degrees Celsius. Now, this is based on the slopes of the, um, the sensitivity of the sea ice area in millions of square kilometers per degree Celsius rise. So the variation, it was minus 4.1 million square kilometers per degree Celsius for September, actually minus 4.4 for August, that was the highest. And then that number drops to about minus 1.6 for February and March. With a two degree Celsius rise over 
pre-industrial global average temperature rise, we're likely to have no sea ice in so in August and September, and with a 2.5 degrees Celsius, no sea ice in July, August, September, and October for those four months of the year. Because the question is, you know, do we go to a completely ice-free Arctic year-round within a decade of the first blue ocean event, or does it hold out for, for longer? Okay, so I'm going to talk all about these things in this very important paper, and it'll probably run over to two videos. I haven't talked about the coronavirus much recently on my videos, but I'll probably do, you know, I'll, I'll probably do a, a video or two soon. I mean, the gist is a new paper has come out by the Johns Hopkins University people, and it argues that, you know, the global testing for the coronavirus, you know, people test positive, people test negative. It turns out that the false negative rate, according to this study, is um, 20%, which is, which is actually quite, quite large. It's huge. And in fact, you know, that, that's the lowest uh, false negative rate. Um, it depends where you are in the cycle. So if you're infected on, the, on day one, the false negative rate is 100%. On day five, it drops to about 38%. And on day eight, I believe, it drops to that minus 20%. And then it, it goes up after that. It becomes larger than 20 again. So 20% seems to be the minimum, and that's the false positive rate. So to give you an example, in Canada, they've done 2 million, 2 million people have tested, been tested for the coronavirus. But 100,000 have tested positive. So that lead, leaves the number of negative, t negative results is about 1.9 million in Canada. 20% of 1.9 million is 380,000 people. So what is this saying? That 380,000 people in Canada can have it, but they tested negative? Of course, if you have the only way around this with that type of test is you need to do test twice. So test somebody, maybe test them, you know, test them again. Um, you need to, you know, the next day or within a week, say, probably the next day or the next few days. And then if they test positive twice, you know, 20% error and a 20% error multiplied out, that's only a 4% error or so. So if they test negative twice, they probably don't have the coronavirus. But if you test them once, there can be a lot of false, uh, false uh, negative, false, false negatives. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, false negative, false positive. You test them and they test negative, but they're actually positive, so it's actually a false, false negative. But anyway, um, this is very important. I'll talk about that. The other thing is, I've mentioned this before, the, the coronavirus is an indoor disease. You are very unlikely to get it outside. So outside, make sure you social distance that two meters. You know, if you're outside at a rally and somebody coughs right on you, you can get it. If you have contact with people, you can get it in any situation. But if you're outside and you're, and you're two meters away, six feet away, you're probably not going to get it. The number of uh, transmission cases outside are very, very low. Meanwhile, if you're inside, it's very, very important to wear, wear the mask inside. You go inside, wear the mask. If the windows are open, there's good ventilation. Likelihood of getting it is low, but I think it should be mandatory in most countries, in all countries around the world, and that gives us our best chance of, of suppressing the virus. You know, so your so society is opening up, but wear masks inside. So I'm gonna, I'll do a, you know, a separate video or a rant on, on that. I'm trying to send letters to governments, et cetera, to say, you know, to, to say these facts. And, I don't know about you, maybe you've, if you've seen any messaging, you know, in your country or your local region saying what I'm saying about being an indoor disease, then let me know. I mean, I see all kinds of people wearing masks outside and I'm thinking, you know, they really don't need to. And, you know, masks can be very uncomfortable, especially if it's hot outside. So just wear them when they're necessary, which is in indoor environments to cut your risk. Okay, so let's get back to the Arctic sea ice. Let's look at the look at the data here. Okay, and um, this will definitely continue into a second video. So this is my last uh, few videos on what happens to sea ice after the few first blue ocean event. And I talked about 
uh, a paper uh, called The Changing State of Arctic Sea Ice Across All Seasons. And now I'm talking about this paper, Arctic Sea Ice in a 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer world. And if you just Google this title, it's open source. Uh, you know, you can get access to it. Okay, so let's look at the details from this paper. The key findings, it's unlikely that September Arctic sea ice vanishes for 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming. September sea ice might vanish for two, but observational uncertainty prevents a conclusive statement. The internal variab variability causes a range of plus or minus 0 0.2 degrees Celsius. The internal variability I've talked about is sort of, is due to the chaotic nature of the climate system. So what did these guys do? Okay, Knotts is an author on the previous papers I discussed. And, uh, you know, here's a different person who's the lead author, um, Anne-Laura nieder Delenk. So they looked at two sets of observational records, right? And that gives you the uncertainty, sort of the internal variability. Um, well, no, sorry, that gives you the, the, um, the, the uh, sensitivity of Arctic sea ice area to emissions. And then they did 100 simulations of historical and future climate evolution from an Earth system model, and that gives you the internal variability. So based on these observations, the high sensitivity observations, Arctic sea ice, September sea ice is lost with low probability, about 10%, for global warming of 1.5 above pre-industrial and with very high probability for global warming of plus two above pre-industrial. For the low sensitivity observations, right, there's two sets of observations. The um, September ice stuck around for 1.5, right, 1% chance of disappearing and low likelihood about 10% to disappear even for two degrees. In March, the loss was 15 to 20 percent of Arctic sea ice for 1.5 to 2 C warming. Okay, um, so the key, one of the key things is, is you know we know it's been declining rapidly for decades. The observed loss of sea ice is tightly coupled to increasing global mean air temperature. It's actually obviously tightly coupled to the Arctic air temperature. And remember that the Arctic air temperature is three to five times higher than the global mean air temperature, right? Um, and so, you know, as the ice vanishes, if that number stays the same, then that would mean that the tight coupling to global temperature stays the same clearly. But if the Arctic temperature amplification varies, then it will take away this tight coupling to the global mean air temperature. And I suspect the latter case might be what happens. And of course, the global mean air temperature is tied to cumulative anthropogenic CO2 emissions, or which I talked about the slopes of in the of the, the relationship to though that in the previous um, previous um, paper uh, paper I discussed in previous videos. You know, we talked about two to three meters squared loss of sea ice per ton of CO2 emissions. Okay, and of course the 1.5 and 2 are talked about a lot because they're, uh, you know, the focus in the Paris Agreement. Okay, so in this paper they estimate the mean seasonal cycle of sea ice for a given maximum level of global warming, considering internal variability from the simulations, and the observational record allows an estimate of the sensitivity of the sea ice area to a given global mean warming. Okay, um, and they say this approach does not work in the Antarctic because of sea ice dynamics. It's quite different in the Antarctic. Okay, so in this figure, it shows the average mean global surface air temperature anomalies from two different sets of observations, that the Hadley observations and the uh, gist temp um, uh, observa uh, observed data, and the historical Simulations are in gray, so we've got the red line, the black line is the Hadley, and the red line is, is uh, Goddard Institute uh, for Space um, data. Okay, so you see those two things, and uh, the, this is the uh, surface temperature anomaly with respect to the pre-industrial, and I'll explain what, that, what they use for that uh, next video. So thanks for listening.